Good. Good morning, guys. Thank you, Song Ministry. Uh, man, I just feel like I always feel so ministered to by these guys. Every Sunday they prepare. Um, so thank you guys for just loving God and helping us love God. Amen. Well, guys, uh, very exciting weekend. You know, we have our Christmas banquet tonight, 530. 530 um, at the Elks Lodge. OK, so we'll have a lot of fun. Bring out your dancing shoes. Uh, I guess that, that sounds kind of funny, 5.30 at the Elks Lodge, but that's where we'll be tonight, at the Elks Lodge, celebrating um, an awesome year together, uh, serving God and what God has done, um, so very excited for that. Um, so hopefully, guys, you are preparing for the holidays with Christmas and New Year's upon us, that um, you're experiencing some good family time, that God, you're, you're feeling God minister in your life. I, for me, recently, right, you, you, this is season of gift giving, and um, Ruth is four now, as many of you guys know, and she's becoming more aware of what gifts she wants. You can't just kind of give her whatever, you know, it, it has to be, there. she has demands now, she has, she has preferences, and so you got to manage these preferences, right, and I, you know, it's, it's as much as you can, like, you, know, you can't have everything you want, but um, a few months ago, uh, it might have been October, even September, we drive, I, I drive her to preschool, and we'll, we'd pass the Walmart. And every time we pass the Walmart, she go, oh, Dad, I want the burble, the burble. I'm like, what's a burble? You know, and I, I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. You're not getting it, you know, and um, you're not getting, well, I don't know what this burble is, but not today, you know. You're going to school. And, she's, and you know, as the weeks went by, like, oh, Mom said I could have the burble for Christmas. And I'm like, I, what is this burble? And life goes on, right? I, I don't think this ask my wife, what are you, what, what, what is this burble, you know, and as we, as, as things progress, finally she realizes it's a Furby, uh, and uh, she's been trying to say Furby the whole time, and I don't know if you guys remember what the Furbies were, but life has come full circle, um, kids want Furbies again, and uh, they're odd creatures, you know, and uh, Melissa had one when she was a kid, and she'll tell the story to Ruth, and Ruth wants the story told over and over of when Melissa threw her Furby down the stairs as a child. And Ruth just, I think Ruth wants to reenact this with all of her heart. Um, I think that's the reason why she wants this Furby. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we, we've had to manage it, but as through it all, like, look, uh, not Melissa, Ruth, you have to wait for this doll. You cannot have it now. And there's a, it's not Christmas yet. And so, you know, if anybody that's raised kids, you probably understand that, right? You're just constantly, like, trying to teach them patience. You understand, child, right? Like, there's, there's a holiday for this. But also the principle is you can't have everything right away. And God is very much like that. God's a good, good father. In due time, he will give us the right gift at the right time with the right purpose, with the right heart behind it. And, uh, and oftentimes, we just don't understand that, um, you know, there's a bigger world outside of us, right? That there's, there's many things that God has to consider in terms of when he gives us something, how he gives us something. What will that, how could that impact us as we receive this gift moving forward? So turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. And, um, you know, we're, yeah, I know, it's like, Revelation, where are you going, Janice? Um, we were talking about Furbies, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going today? Um, but I, 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 as I alluded to on Wednesday night, um, we're going to, you know, consider um, Christmas from heaven's perspective this morning. And um, there's a lot that we can pick up from Revelations 12. But something I want us to take away this morning is that God is a gift giver. He's a powerful gift giver. But there's a bigger picture to these gifts that he gives to us. Amen. There's something beyond. There's something powerful. And so when we don't receive the gift we want, for example, and sometimes Christmas is like that, right? It's like, man, God, you didn't, you didn't bless me the way I thought you would this year. Or maybe you did receive what you want, and sometimes God wants to give you a proper perspective for why you've been blessed with what you've been blessed with. Sometimes we don't use the blessings that we've been given for God's glory, right? And so how could God be trying to teach us through the gifts he gives us? Revelation 12 this morning, we're going to talk about another piece of a blessed Christmas, and that is having gifts from God. Amen? 
Can you say a prayer, and then we'll dive into Revelation 12. Father, good morning. Um, it is good, Lord, to um, focus on you and focus on your word. Um, God, uh, we, we need your word. We need your promises. We need your hope. We need the conviction that comes from it. We need the discipline that comes from it. Uh, we also need the comfort that comes from it. We need the, um, the joy that comes from it, Lord. Uh, who you are and your message is powerful. And uh, we want to cling to it. So I pray this morning, Lord, as we continue to approach Christmas, as we continue to approach the new year, that um, our cling to you, our desire to know you and understand you just continues to grow and that you meet that desire, Lord, that you help us become more like you, that you help us to think more like you and to live more like you, Lord. We love you. We need you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Revelation 12, you guys there? So there's a lot of, you know, obviously Revelation, there's, there's many, many interpretations to the, the, the images that are, we're about to read. Um, but let's just kind of try to take everything as best we can um, just on paper and just read it and try to visualize ourselves in this moment. Amen? Chapter 12, verse 1, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared to, in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that at, uh, it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation, and the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Because, uh, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the play, uh, place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half of time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. What an epic story, right? This is powerful to read about that. As we think about Christmas, this was the backdrop behind it. This is what was happening 2,000 years ago, roughly. And the first thing, right, God is the gift giver in all of this. God is the father. He's the one that is clearly trying to take care of his family. And the first gift he gives to his family in the midst of this epic battle is he gives us a way. He gives us a way. What does that mean, that he gives us a way? He gives us a path. He gives us a, 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 a method of overcoming. What does that mean? I've, I've conf I talked to a doctor, a biblical scholar. His name is Bill Molden. Dr. Bill Molden, also known as Haley's dad, right? And, 
and um, smart guy. The other guy's read way more Bible and read way more stuff about the Bible than I could ever plan to, plan to ever read about the Bible. And, um, but also a great man of God. And um, so a lot of these things I've, I've kind of bounced off him. And a pretty consistent scholarly view, right? There's Bible scholars out there. And there's some disagreements in here, but there's some there's pretty consistent views here that the woman in this passage is Israel, the nation of Israel. That, that crazy nation you read about in the Old Testament, it's them. They're the woman. And once again, similar to what we read last week, right, we see this theme of how God wants to bless, he wants to take care of, he wants to look after people who are vulnerable and even people who are on the run. We saw that last week, right, with Mary and Joseph and the, the infant Jesus. They were on the run, and God says, man, they're blessed. In this situation, we see that Israel, the mom, the mother, the pregnant mother, was on the run. She was in a vulnerable spot, and yet God was taking care of her. God wants to take care of those who are overmatched. God wants to take care of those who can't take care of themselves and have the guts to admit that. If you read the Old Testament, Mitch, many of us here have, right, you see a people who, you read it, they honestly, they can't take care of themselves. They, it, is a, it is a mess after mess after mess. You read Judges alone, and you're like, God, why did you pick these people? They're a mess. You send them somebody, and sometimes the people you send are just crazy, like Samson? Samson was it? God, that's the best we could do with Samson? Like, geez, Louise, this, <laughs> that's the woman. She just cannot take care of herself. She needs help. And yet, when you read about Israel, you read about a people who are loved by God. Despite all of their, 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 their flaws and their failures and their sin, they're loved by God. God keeps reaching out to them. But they can never seem to remember how loved they are. It's a vulnerable nation. It's a vulnerable people. And yet it is through this vulnerable nation, this woman on the run from a dragon. If you were to place bets, I mean, okay, who's going to win? Dragon, woman. We know who's going to win, right? If you just place them, uh, you know, mano y mano. And yet God chooses this woman that you're going to birth the Messiah. God knows the woman cannot fight off the dragon, so God does what he always does. He gives the woman a way. He gives her a way to overcome. He gives her not just a way to survive, but a way to thrive, a way to fulfill her calling. You read about all these times, right, that this woman has been given, 1,260 days to be taken care of. God gives her wings of eagles. God gives her times, times and a half, whatever that means, right? That's some crazy God arithmetic. I'm like, what, what does that even mean? And there's some ideas to what those fulfillments could be. There's a limited time, right, of the woman being protected. And so some ideas are, we know that in AD 70, Jerusalem was crushed by Rome. So there's an idea that maybe that was that, that God was like, hey, you have some time to repent and follow Jesus. But there's going to be a time. I'm going to let Rome have their way with you. So there's an idea there. But either way, God was merciful to this woman. God took care of this woman. God, God gave this woman time. When God's people can't find their way, he gives them a way. When God's people have lost their way, he, ha- he, he helps them reorient their GPS. And he goes, hey, look, I got you taken care of. I'm still going to give you a way out. I love how God sends the arch, archangel Michael to fight on behalf of this woman. God sends his armies to protect the weak. One, one angel could take down a city, biblically speaking. God sends his angels to protect the weak. And we can imagine the scene looks something like this. It's just an artist's rendering of what this could look like. Look at that. Doesn't that look amazing? Like that's just to visualize it. That is more epic than anything from Lord of the Rings, which Lord of the Rings is loosely based around Scripture. That is amazing. Name the grand adventure. 
Name the grand battle. And this battle between the dragon and heaven's armies was grander. It was more magnificent. There was more at stake. There was more on the line. And yet in the middle of it, in the midst of swords, flaming arrows, angels and demons clashing and colliding. You imagine one angel, one demon just colliding against each other. Perhaps just the cosmic bang that occurred. Hidden in the midst of all this struggle, the purpose of it all was God was trying to protect this woman and her child. In the midst of it all, in the very center of it, the purpose of this was God was protecting this vulnerable woman and infant. God finds a way when we've lost our way. Have you felt weak or lost or vulnerable in 2023? Have you felt helpless or hopeless? Have you felt like, I've lost my way? I can't find my way. Or the way is too hard. I found a way, but man, Jesus, I need, I need some help coming down this way. Have you felt stuck or unable to change? Or have you felt like the circumstances you wish would change have not changed at all? Revelation 12 reminds us this morning that despite all of the trial and, and, and fear and hopelessness we may have felt, we still have a God who wants to give us a way. No matter how perilous or problematic your life seems, God is looking out for you in the midst of this grand battle. Between, it's still spiritual warfare out there, Ephesians says, right? The battle is not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 says, but against the, the, the armies, the dark armies of this world. In the midst of all that, God, the way God looked out for that woman, in the, in the very center of it, God says, no, 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 I've still got my eye on you. I'm still looking out for you. I haven't lost you. You're the reason why I fight. That's what God said. He looks at the Columbia church. He looks at, he looks at any church of faithful people and the people who are seeking him. He goes, you're the reason why I fight. You're why Michael fights. You're why his angels fight. He has not lost you, and he still has a way for you to live. He still has a calling for your life. He still has a dream for you. He still has a vision for you. Last week, I challenged us as a church to, as we prepare for next year, to think about and seek counsel from one another on how the Lord could be calling each of us to look more like Jesus next year, right? We're supposed to ask somebody, pray, ask God, God, how can how, what, are some, what are some few ways that I could just focus to be more like you? How could I serve more like you? How could I share my faith more like you? How could I draw deeper and be closer in my walk with you? I want to ask us, have we followed through on that challenge? And if you have, do you believe that God will make a way for you to become who he's calling you to become? You know, God had a vision for Israel. Israel was a mess, but God always had a vision for Israel. From the very beginning, he said, you're going to be the light to the nations. And you can imagine that that's scary. Is God, is who God calling you to become a little scary to you? A little intimidating? Because with any change comes adjustments and sacrifices. Is the idea of making some changes somewhat overwhelming? Is going where God could be calling you to go. Anxiety provoking. Is it challenge your preconceived notions about yourself, the things we hold on to? Is it overwhelming to think about? Is it just, I don't even know where to go, God? I can relate. Whatever you may have felt, I can relate. I shared with you guys this past Wednesday of this year, I felt like God was calling me to not just share the gospel with people, but to really believe in people the way I used to. As a younger campus minister, it was scary, really scary actually, to actually choose to believe that God could be calling every single person I talk to because that means I'm actually having to really put my heart out there. And that means whenever your heart's out there, your heart could get hurt. And that was scary for me. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to put my heart back out there. 
I can assume I'm not the only one that's felt similar. To allow God to take us to greater depths in order to reach greater heights, it is scary. Just like this scene in Revelation. Any battle is scary. But I, I want to encourage us that somehow, some way, God will give us victory so we can follow the Lord's call upon our life with confidence. Amen? And God knows that, and so as he gives us away, he also gives us a warrior. He gives us a warrior. A few things here we remember about Jesus, right? Verse 5 reminds us that there's a prophecy about this male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. God was planning, had always planned to give his people a warrior who would lead them in battle, who would show them how to fight. And then verse 11 is powerful. It reminds us of how every faithful man and woman of God has ever stayed the course. It says they triumphed over him, over Satan. Little old us can triumph over Satan. By what? By the blood of the Lamb. Love that song we sing. Where we sing out these very words. Ye shall overcome through the blood of the Lamb. Because these words, this passage that it's inspired from, it reminds us that victory is inevitable for a Christian. It's inevitable. Not a matter of if, but when. There will be loss. There will be pain. There will be hardship. There will be trial. But in the end, there will be victory. Christians will triumph by the blood of the Lamb. When God gives his people away, he gives them a warrior to pave the way, to show them how to walk that path. In the Old Testament, God gave them Moses. And he parted the Red Sea. And he walked that path with them, with the seas parted, to give them a way out of physical slavery, right? Thousands of years after Moses, God gives everyone Jesus to give us a way out of spiritual slavery. God has given you and I a warrior to win and fight our battles. He gives us a warrior to change the tide when all seems lost. We have an accuser, church. We have an enemy. There's a reason why we need a warrior, because we have an enemy. There is a dragon. There is a serpent. And he will whisper in our ears about why we cannot raise up and grow in our faith, why we cannot mature and become more engaged in the mission that we, than we ever have. There's, he's going to whisper reasons that you cannot be the man or woman that God is calling you to be. You cannot be more patient. You cannot be more loving. You cannot be more sacrificial. There's no way. You sacrificed enough. You love enough. That's what Satan wants us to say. And guess what? You're actually entitled to some love. You're entitled to someone sacrificing for you. You're entitled to someone loving you the way you've never been loved before because, you know, it's all about you. The way you've sacrificed, it's about you. The accuser will tell us lies to convince us there's no way we can be more serving the way you've already served, Janice Abelia. Bud Price, you served. Lydia and David Harbrick, you've served. You, you don't need any more. Craig and Jen Nitsch, you've served. You, you've taken in orphans. Why? You don't need anything. You, you deserve the world. And we get entitled. Janice, you've sacrificed. You've, you've fought through so much. You've lost this. You've lost that. You deserve it all. I can buy into these lies pretty easily. It doesn't take long. Like, yeah, I do. I do. I do. I do believe. I, yes. It's very subtle. And I don't walk around. I do believe, you know, but in my heart, it's in there. There's no way we can be more honest about how we feel. We, we can't be more transparent. We can't talk about our sin. It's hard. 
There's no way I can help someone else become a Christian. You know how hard that is to help someone else become a Christian? There's no way I can become a Christian. I gotta give stuff up, man. What? I can't be a Christian. That's too hard. The accuser's been whispering for a long time. But the Bible says that vulnerable men and women of God through the centuries haven't just won, they've triumphed over their accuser. A triumph is an obvious win. A triumph makes it clear who was the superior force in the conflict. And Jesus wants the victory of his loved ones to be so clear, so obvious he was fighting for them, that he says, I'm going to shed my blood. Our warrior helps us overcome. He helps us find a way because he laid down his life. He, he says, you know what, you're vulnerable, and I get it because you're vulnerable. You don't want to be vulnerable, so let me be vulnerable first. Let me lay my life down. And this is how we triumph. We triumph when we lay down our lives. We win when we choose to lose it all for something greater. Do we believe in our warrior, brothers and sisters? Do we believe in how he lived his life? Do we believe in his lifestyle of self-denial, self-sacrifice, everything on the line for a greater purpose, for the kingdom of God? If we believe that, we will follow him, amen? And that's the last thing that God gives us. He gives us a warrior, and therefore, he gives us a chance to witness he gives us a chance to witness. Verse 17, as it ends, the story, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Who are the offspring? Who are the ones the serpent wages war against? Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Tra uh, testimony here translated as witness is actually, in the Greek, a word called martus, M-A-R-T-U-S. I think you can probably deduce where we get the word martyr from. It's from this Greek word, martus. Same word as martyr. A witness is a martyr. A witness is willing to die for what they've seen, the truth they've seen, the good they've seen, the love they've seen. They've witnessed God move in their lives. They've witnessed the power of vulnerability. They've witnessed the power of the cross. And that's why we get a chance to witness. We get it. This is a gift from God that we get to share about what Jesus has done in our lives. We get to witness how vulnerability has always led to grace and love and peace. So, simple question is this, how have you witnessed Jesus in your life? How have you witnessed him, not just in the obvious victory sometimes, sometimes we long for obvious victories, but how have you witnessed him in the trials? How have you seen him walk with you in the valley? How have you seen him be patient with you in your sin? How have you seen him try to help you chip away at this character that at once may have felt impossible to ever change? How have you, how have you seen him send soul after soul after soul your way to help you become more like him? I don't deserve to be a part of the kingdom of God. God has sent so many people my way just to work and chip away on this sinful character of mine. So sometimes it is witnessing to God has done amazing things in my life. The birth of my child, my marriage, uh, my, you know, just seeing people become Christians is powerful. It's amazing. I, I got emotional seeing Trinity. I heard Trinity go, oh, I love this song. We sang God Alone. She's like, I love this song. Like, I love this song too, girl. Like, but I was like, man, me and Anna Freeman, I remember stopping her on campus a few years ago. I'm like, this girl loves God alone. Like, I got emotional. I was like, this is why we share our faith. 
for people to say, I don't need nothing except you, God. God alone. I'm like, that's what, that's what it's all about. That's why we have awkward conversations about God. And it feels, because when someone says, God alone, they're like, Man, that's, what, that's everything that's right about the world. So, yeah, we want to always make it about that because it's awesome. But God isn't just in those moments. God is in those moments when you're mourning. And we talk about that all year. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. We think everything's, I love to laugh. I love to laugh. Lord, you guys know we love to laugh about the most silly things. But sometimes we live in a culture, we just throw the next funny thing at each other through viral TikToks and Instagram reels and all the things. I can't keep up with the way medium is nowadays. Is it going to be a new thing five days from now? And yet we, we try to medicate. We just laugh, 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 laugh. And we try to, we try to make things, and we try to be stoic about things. No, we, bless those who mourn because Jesus is there. We talked about that. Bless are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. How have you seen Jesus through the valleys this year? How has Jesus changed your life through the valleys? Because we got a witness to that. We witness through the highs and through the lows. Because oftentimes the world needs to hear. Of course, there's so many. In the secular world, of course, your God is with you when things are good in your life. It's a very basic atheistic argument. Of course you worship your God. But I think even the secular mind has to question, well, what? And that's why Rome was turned upside down. The most powerful empire the world has ever seen, upside down, because vulnerable people were willing to die for their testimony. The most powerful empire ever brought to its knees by a Silly little movement of people who followed a carpenter who died on a tree because those silly little people would not back off what they had believed about Jesus. How has Jesus changed your life? What's your testimony? How have you seen him through the highs and the lows and everything in between, through every tear, through every laugh, through every boring moment, through every crazy moment? He's been there. He's walked with you. And if you have, a, if any of us have a challenge right now, thinking about where God's calling us to go, maybe the question is, maybe you shouldn't ask advice. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't ask the brother or sister you're close to, where could God be taking you? Maybe the question is, how has God been with me? Where have you seen him walk with me this whole year? Because I can't see it right now. I've needed that. I needed, I needed men in my life, women in my, women in my life, my wife all the time. God's right there. What are you talking about? I'm like, oh, my bad. You're right. He's right there. Sorry. <laughs> I've needed people to remind me that God is present. And if you don't have a testimony, God wants to give you one. God wants to give you moments where, where you can sing, God alone. He is my rock. He is my salvation. And mean it. When he wants to give you experiences where you realize that there is nothing in this world that's worth more than Jesus. A walk with Jesus is worth more than anything. He wants you to experience that, to, to fully grasp that. God wants to give you memories that you can look back on and remember that he came through time and time again for you. It's a gift, a chance to witness. I hope, brothers and sisters, that your Christmas is blessed as we head into the new year. Amen? And let's think about all these ways that even now God's gifting to us. He gives us a way. He gives us a way. When all seems lost, there's always a way. He gives us a warrior to show us how to walk that path, to show us how to make it. Because that path sometimes, that way is a little bit up and down. It's a little bit steep sometimes. Sometimes the down slope's too fast and you stumble. But he gives you a warrior to show how to walk it and to pick you up along the way. And finally, he gives you a chance to witness about that warrior, to witness about how he's there, how he is, as we sang, he is our friend. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Thank you.
Okay, there we go. I was told I had to adjust the mic before I speak. Um, but yeah, so Janice, wow, that was good. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect reading out of Revelation, you know, talking about the woman and the dragon and whatnot, uh, especially after last week hearing about just the story of just, um, why am I forgetting, King Herod and just the escape to Egypt and all of that. I don't know, this was, I, thank you, this was really good. I felt like for me, uh, just hearing about just he gives us away, uh, and just, you know, you ask the question about, have I felt lost or hopeless sort of recently? And I feel like, in a way, I sort of have. I feel like this semester, reaching out on campus, you know, at the start of the semester, I was fired up. It was great. You know, it was all fun and amazing. And then, you know, going through the semester, going through studies, I thought it was going to be great. And then it just sort of started to just really just plummet. And I felt really hopeless for some just people, you know, I was just really in the studies with. I was really trying to fight for, and I just started to feel like, you know, I don't know how I feel about this anymore, you know? I just felt really hopeless. I, I was just sort of like, is this really what you want from me, God, you know? Like, you're, you ask us to bear fruit. You ask us to make disciples, and here I feel like I'm trying to give my heart, trying to do this all, and I just feel like I'm not able to do any of that, you know? Um, and so, you know, I just felt like, you know, I, I'm just sort of focusing on just the bad of that. I'm just hearing Satan now whisper in my ear, you can't do it. You can't make disciples. You can't do it at all. You're not having enough faith. And so, I don't know, Janice, it was just really cool hearing you listen to talk about how even through that, God gives a way to overcome. He gives us that warrior to fight for us, to fight against that whisper from the dragon, you know. Even just that, that image you had of the dragon and Michael and just all of his angels fighting off of that. And that's just for the woman, right? And we talk about, I remember like after like every baptism, we, we talk about like there's that hedge of angels just around each person. And so I just think about, well, I, then I also, you know, with that spiritual war, I still have those angels who are fighting for me. I still have God who's fighting for me giving me that warrior to overcome. And so why I can't listen to those lies, you know? I can't listen to those lies of just being unable to do that. And so I just thank you, Janice, just for that and just for this lesson just on being able to overcome, you know, because I have really felt hopeless as of recently. Um, but besides all of that, um, I'm going to pray, and we're going to have one final song. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you just for in this time, God, just to gather and just talk about just Christmas and all of just the birth of Jesus and everything that just comes with it. Just how there was how there's so much more than just this baby being born, God. How there's just so much actual conflict and just flight and just there's there's a lot more, God. I'm just glad that we can dive into that and really explore how this is how you fought for your son. This is also how you fight for us, God. And this is how you really care for us and love us. I pray that we can just really focus on that and really see you just in those ways just throughout our life. Um, I thank you for your son and his sacrifice. Jesus, I pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead.